that listing agreement is in executory status, meaning we are working on it as we speak. Once we find a buyer and it closes, it then becomes executed. So think of it like a transition. Contract gets formed, you're working on it, executory, you sell it and complete it, it is now executed. So look for a question that has something to do with what status and are they still doing it? It's here, if they're completed, it's here. That would be the question that I would use. Anybody remember my story about this word? What does acceptance mean? Very crucial, very crucial what acceptance means. Is that the one with, is that the one with the uh, fax machine? Yep. <laughs> my $49,000 golf outing. Both parties have to know to be accepted. Now, in the scenario of I'll wash your car for $20 and I'm standing here talking to you or I called you on the phone and you go, yeah, that's a deal. Let's do it. That is almost instantaneous because I heard Darren say that. In a situation of where they send an email over to us, they are in a waiting game. You don't know what that other side's doing. Maybe they haven't seen it yet. Maybe they're at the golf course. <laughs> Maybe they've got it and they're getting it signed. But until it comes back to me and I see the signature of your client, it has not been accepted yet, no matter what you guys agree on. You've got to tell me. Very crucial. So think of a question like that. Until you send me the acceptance, I can rescind the offer. Even if you're getting ready to push the send button and bink, you get to rescind it too late. So for both parties to know, it has to be delivered and we use this thing called, you may have heard it before, called the mailbox rule or the postings rule, which means the second it hits your inbox, it's accepted by you. Even though you're on the golf course, you haven't read it yet, doesn't matter. You accepted it in your inbox. The mailbox rule says the second I drop it in the mailbox in the old days of letters, it was considered accepted by your side. Now, the second I send it, it hits your inbox, it is accepted by you. Even though you haven't read it for 10 minutes because you've been in class, even though your client hadn't read it because you haven't forwarded it to them, doesn't matter. It's now accepted once it hits your inbox. Questions? They use a read receipt to verify that it landed? That's usually one of the best things. One of the things I typically love to require of my agents is they use the email first name at the Modulin Group because I can get into the uh, server and see when it was delivered and received. People that want to use a Gmail account I have a hard time getting Gmail to confirm that it was what time it was delivered and received without using that read receipt. All right. Now, I've had to actually have that scenario twice where the other agent claimed we didn't get it and they went with another offer. So I actually went into our server and said, no, it says it was delivered here on this date. Maybe you put it in the trash, maybe you didn't see it, whatever, but we hit our deadline. 
Now, breach of a contract. Breach means one party or the other has not done what they are supposed to be doing. Ordering the inspection, getting the appraisal, getting their financing in place, or showing the uh, letting me show the property. Whatever the contract says, you have to do. If you fail, sorry, thought I heard a question. If you fail to do your side, you could be in breach of the contract. If you are in breach, there are legal ramifications from that. And those legal ramifications usually are defined inside of the contract. If the buyer fails to buy the property, he could be subjected to losing his earnest money to the seller as a remedy for the seller taking his house off of the property and then the buyer didn't buy. That's a very common one you hear. I'm going to keep your earnest money. I don't know why my voice sounded like that, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. All right. So there are remedies. We've talked about the termination and the rescission. You can rescind. A rescind puts both parties back into the original case as if nothing ever happened. There was a question at one time that said, if the buyer sends an offer and their $500 earnest money check to the listing agent, before the listing agent accepts it, the buyer rescinds the offer. Does he get his earnest money back? I believe so. The answer is yes, because a rescission restores everybody to their original position, which means the $500 gets restored back to the original person it came from. They cannot rescind. One of the things I say all the time, and I'll probably get in trouble for this at some point one day. Think of a rescission as like an annulment. In a marriage annulment, it is is it is as if it never happened. An annulment is different than a divorce. A divorce says we were married, now we're not married. A rescission is like it never happened. I never made the offer, we were never under contract, none of that. So we get restored back to our original position. If I terminate or cancel a contract, we were under contract, now we're not. And the reason I canceled or terminated may cause a breach and may cost me money. All right. If a buyer wakes up one day and says, I don't like the house purple, and decides not to buy it, that is not a legal reason to cancel the contract. He would be in breach and could be subject to specific performance. Now, if he didn't close it because he couldn't get his financing, which we made a contingency, this is a different story. Do not get confused on these during the exam. If you gave me an offer that said, I want to buy your house subject to my dog singing the alphabet and I took that offer and accepted it and then all of a sudden you call me and go, hey, my dog didn't sing the alphabet, which was a contingency that was not met. I get out of the deal legally. 
and we currently have like financing contingency. We have a home appraisal contingency. We may have uh, a first right of refusal contingency saying I've got to sell my house before I buy yours. If I can't sell my house, then my offer to you is not valid. I get out of the deal. So a contingency is a set of agreements or terms or actions that have to be met is the word or the other time, the other thing you will hear it called, they have to be cleared for the purchase agreement to move forward. If the buyer couldn't get a loan, the purchase agreement can't move forward. Both parties get released from the contract. They get divorced. They were under contract, now they're not. All right. Any questions about contingencies or rescissions there? No. We use e-signatures. You know, here's something that's very interesting. During that whole COVID-19 and lockdown and stay at home, everybody was talking about, well, we're going to have to do all this no touch kind of stuff. Do you realize that the real estate world, about 80% of everything we did or have been doing for the last four or five years has been no touch. We now fill out our forms electronically. We email them to the client. The client uses DocuSign or eSign or any of those and then sends it back to us via email at which point we then send it to the other side of the table who signs it electronically to accept it. And then we call and order title work and send them the purchase agreement. We call the appraiser or the home inspector and the appraiser. We have been doing this no touch. The only thing that we had issues with was overcoming this obstacle of showings. Think about this. In the last four or five years, the only time we've really seen our client is during the showing. And we found a way to get around that. So our business during that no touch time frame, when all these people were trying to figure out how to deliver pizzas with no touch or have a restaurant with no touch and have been marketing as a, you know, contactless delivery and all that. We've been doing that for years already. So it played right into our strengths from the real estate standpoint because of the only time we ever really saw or touched anything was during the showing. So we had to modify that a little bit. But other than that, we've been using e-signatures. We've been doing paperless transactions. Everything's done via email now. We had closings that were what they call curbside. And if you know that, remember the old uh, a and root beer curbside, you pull up here and they take your order and another guy beside you. That's what they were literally doing. Title company come out, give the seller an iPad, give the buyer an iPad, would then call them. They would talk, touch, fill out on the iPad screen and all the paperwork would be then printed in. Title company come out and go, here's your copy. Have a good day. So we were doing contactless. Question? Well, actually, we bought our house here in Indy that way. We were in California, and we did a virtual seeing of the house. We never actually physically saw our house until uh, final walkthrough, which was the day before we closed. Yeah. yeah. So that is the extreme version, and that is happening too. So this whole thing where, you know, all these food places are like, how do we come up with no touch and all that? We've been doing it. We've been doing it for five years. And if you remember, if you do remember that story about my golfing and what acceptance means, 
I think I prefaced that whole story with that scenario wouldn't happen in today's technology because of exactly what I'm talking about. The other agent would have emailed me that offer. I would have forwarded it to my seller standing on the golf course. I could have pulled my phone up and went, oh, forward Manny. Manny would have signed it, sent it back, probably all in the span of one hole of golf. And that's what I'm talking about. We have gone to this now for years. Um, bilateral, real easy to remember. Bilateral, Oop, where'd we go? <clears throat> bilateral means two, both parties must act. Unilateral is one party. Trivia question for the day. What's the only unilateral agreement we use in real estate? Option. The option. I wrote it down there. The option is the only unilateral one we have, meaning it's the only one where only one party has to act. The seller must sell if the buyer decides to exercise his option. <clears throat> All right. In the contract, there are many different clauses we could use. When we change something, we use an amendment. The word amendment, amend, means to change. What's the legal version of this word? Remember novate? You novate a contract means to change it. And you can change it in one of two ways. The contract stays the same and the parties change. Or the contract changes and the parties stay the same. When the contract changes, this is an amendment. We change the purchase price from 180 to 175 because we found a defect. And remember, if both parties agree, you can change a contract. If you want to change people, this is the assignment, remember? I can assign the mortgage to someone else. Now, I should have done this one with those two words so I didn't confuse you. We also have another form called an addendum and you see the word add. So this is new words. This is changing words. It's a way to remember it. If I want to change the contract, I would use an amendment. If I want to add something to the contract we don't talk about, like I want the washer and dryer and the pool table and the swing set, I would put that on an addendum because our purchase agreement does not talk about that type of stuff. So I had to add it to the contract. Copacetic. Just did, did this a minute ago. So let's talk about specifically offers and purchase agreements. The general requirements, this is a contract, so all of the general requirements still meet. But that offer is a set of conditions that the buyer would be willing to buy from the seller. And the buyer is also known as what in this scenario when he makes an offer? He is the offer or, remember? He is the offer E. And that offer can either be accepted, it can be outright rejected, 
or it can be countered. So let's talk about the accepted mode we just mentioned earlier. It becomes accepted when the seller signs the acceptance and gives it back to the buyer. Now both parties know. We've talked about that. That was the definition of acceptance. The other one could be flat out rejected. The third thing that could happen is when the buyer makes an offer to the seller, the seller can counter back to the buyer. And a counter is nothing more than a modification of those original terms back to the buyer. But the important thing to remember about a counter is what? It kills the first offer. Exactly. It is a legal rejection of the original offer. So the seller cannot counter back and then all of a sudden go, hey, you know what? I probably should have accepted that. I think I'll call him up and tell him I'm going to take it. No, because once he countered back, that original offer is no longer valid. I had a situation years ago where the sellers were so motivated to move that when they got an offer, that offer was probably, as I recall, like 7,000 below our listing. They didn't even counter because they were afraid if they countered anything, that buyer could legally just walk away from the deal and not be subjected to buying. So the sellers were so motivated when they got the offer, they just accepted it out of the gate, even though it was seven grand below. Because they did not want this to happen. Now we've spoke about a contingency. A contingency is an set of conditions that have to be met for the purchase agreement to continue to move forward. Could be an action, it could be anything. Most notably, the contingencies that we have, we've got a financing contingency, we've got an inspection or an appraisal, but the one I want to say I'll talk about is this one. We talked about this in class. We have this thing called a property sale contingency. And this is where the buyer says, I will buy your home, but I have to sell mine first before I can buy your home. So the buyer is putting into there a property sale contingency. There is a fourth one they talked about called a lien holder contingency where the lien holder has to agree on the amount of money the seller is taking for that property. Why would this one be used? Short sale. Very good. Hallelujah. <laughs> In a short sale. A short sale is where you owe the bank 100, but they take 90 short of the 100 and release the lien. So the seller would have to have the lien holder's approval to take that 90 because he actually owes that. So in a short sale, there has to be a lien holder's contingency that says, hey, Mr. Buyer, I will sell you for 90 as long as my lien holder approves the offer. Because if he doesn't approve the 90, I cannot clear the title because I owe 100. 
I will almost guarantee there's going to be some kind of test question about that to understand what a short sale, how does it work, things of that nature, so that you know that this contingency is a very common one that we have used in the past. Very common in 2009 and 10 and 11. You don't see as many short sales in 2020, but they this was a very popular contingency at one point. <clears throat> Time is of the essence. Time is of the essence has nothing to do with forming the contract. People say, well, I sent you an offer. I gave you till five o'clock tomorrow to answer. Time is of the essence. No, that is the time to accept it. Once we accepted your offer, you told us you would close in 30 days. Here is where time is of the essence is important. I'm sorry, I keep doing that to my zeros. They look more like sixes. You told us you would close in 30 days. Time is of the essence means once we get past this 30 days, one of us or both of us are not subject to completing that contract. Now, you could still be subject to litigation. So if the buyer says, I will close by July the 1st and come July the 2nd, unless they have amended the purchase agreement to change the date, this seller can tell the buyer, see ya. You told me I can't wait forever for you. I've got another buyer on the hook. So you're done. I'm going to sell to the other buyer. Yes, Norma. So if someone doesn't meet that uh, time is of the essence, is that considered a breach? Yes. Okay. That would be a breach because in the contract you told me your buyer, Norma, told me and my seller we were closing on July the 1st. You missed that deadline. We are now not obligated to sell to you. Now, you could still be in trouble. We could still come after your earnest money. We could still go to court. But in the meantime, I'm going to go over here and sell it to someone else because you didn't complete it. All right. Now, here's what happens most of the time. You're going to call me uh, June the 30th, Norma, and you're going to say, my buyer needs three or four more days because of the title work and the whole COVID-19 got everything behind. Can we change this date? And I say, hold on, let me call my seller. I call my seller and say, hey, the buyer needs a couple more days. The seller can say, yeah, because if we don't, we got to put it back on the market. It could be 30 or 40 more days. So give them four or five more days. I say, okay, so Norma, send me an amendment and change that date to July the 9th. You amend the date, closing the date shall be moved from July the 1st to July the 9th. You send it over. My seller signs that amendment. And now in essence, boop, we move this out to the 9th. And now you're able to close. Everybody's happy. But you have to change the date because once we get past that first, you missed time is of the essence. Now you're in violation. So we just move the date out. And as long as both people agree, we can change a contract. Now, if you call me and say, I need three or four more days, and my seller says, no, you don't close, I'm going somewhere else. That will happen occasionally because here's what's going on. Maybe you're under contract at 90 